From the Conference Center at Temple Square in Salt Lake City, this is the Saturday afternoon session of the 186th Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. The music for this session is provided by a choir of missionaries from the Missionary Training Center in Provo, Utah. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Dieter F. Uchtdorf, second counselor in the First Presidency of the Church, will conduct this session. Well, dear brothers and sisters, we welcome you to the afternoon, Saturday afternoon session of the 186th semi-annual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Thomas S. Monson, who presides at the conference, has asked that I conduct this session. We extend our greetings to all who are in attendance or who are participating in their stake centers or by other means. The music for this session will be provided by a choir of missionaries from the Missionary Training Center in Provo, Utah, under the direction of Ryan Eggett and Elmore Keck, with Linda Margetts and Bonnie Goodliff at the organ. The choir will open this meeting by singing Joseph Smith's First Prayer. The invocation will then be offered by Elder Daniel L. Johnson of the 70. President Henry B. Eyring, first counselor of the First Presidency, will then present the general officers and area 70s of the church for a sustaining vote.
Our Heavenly Father, we humbly bow our head seat this afternoon as we are gathered together in this conference center and throughout the world to be taught by thy servants. We are grateful to be presided over by President Thomas S. Monson, thy prophet, and pray that thou wilt strengthen and bless him. Now, Father, those who have prepared talks have prayed earnestly for direction from thee as to what they should say. And we pray that the Holy Ghost will allow them to share with us the feelings and the thoughts that they have prepared. We pray that thou wilt bless those of us who will be listening, that we might be taught by the Holy Ghost, that each one of us might be taught according to our individual needs, and that we might leave this conference with a determination to make those changes in our lives that will bring us closer to thee. We express to thee our gratitude and our love. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Brothers and sisters, President Monson has invited me to present the names of the general officers and Area 70s of the Church to you for your sustaining vote. It is proposed that we sustain Thomas Spencer Monson as prophet, seer, and revelator, and president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Henry Benyon Eyring as First Counselor in the First Presidency, and Dieter Frank Uchtdorf as Second Counselor in the First Presidency. Those in favor may manifest it. Those opposed may manifest it. It is proposed that we sustain Russell Marion Nelson as president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and the following as members of that quorum. Russell M. Nelson, Dallin H. Oakes, M. Russell Ballard, Robert D. Hales, Jeffrey R. Holland, David A. Bednar, Quinton L. Cook, R. Todd Christofferson, Neil L. Anderson, Ronald A. Rasband, Gary E. Stevenson, Dale G. Renlin. Those in favor, please manifest it. Any opposed may so indicate. It is proposed that we sustain the counselors in the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles as prophets, seers, and revelators. All in favor, please manifest it. Contrary, if there be any, by the same sign. It is proposed that we release, with appreciation for their distinguished service, Elders Daniel L. Johnson, Jairo Mazagardi, Kent F. Richards, and Francisco J. Vignes as General 3070s and grant them emeritus status. We note the service of Elder Pierre G. Mom, who passed away July 26, 2016. We express our love and heartfelt condolences to Sister Mom and to their children and grandchildren. Those who wish to join us in expressing gratitude to these brethren for their remarkable service, please so manifest. It is proposed that we release Alan R. Walker as an Area 70. Those who wish to express appreciation to Brother Walker for his service, please so indicate. It is proposed that we sustain the following as Area 70s. Banuke Erandani and Sadido Roman. All in favor, please manifest it. Those opposed, if any. It is proposed that we sustain the other general authorities, Area 70s and general auxiliary presidencies as presently constituted. All in favor, please manifest it. Contrary, if there be any, by the same sign. President Monson. The voting has been noted. We invite those who may have opposed any of the proposals 
to contact their state presidents. Brothers and sisters, thank you for your continued faith and prayers in behalf of the leaders of the Church. Thank you, President Eyring. Thank you, brothers and sisters. The choir will now favor us with a musical number titled Baptism. Following the singing, we will hear from Elders Quentin L. Cook and Gary E. Stevenson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Eternal life is the greatest gift of God and is bestowed on those who keep God's commandments and endure to the end. On the other hand, eternal life with our Heavenly Father is denied those who are not valiant in the testimony of Jesus. There are a number of stumbling blocks to our valor that can prevent us from reaching the goal of eternal life. Stumbling blocks can be complex. Let me illustrate. Many years ago, my father built a small cabin on part of the ranch property where he had been raised. The vistas across the meadows were exceptional. When the walls were framed in for the cabin, I made a visit. I was surprised that the window with the view focused directly on a power pole that was a short distance from the house. To me, it was a huge distraction from the magnificent view. I said, Dad, why did you let them put the power pole directly in front of your view from the window? My father, an exceptional, practical, and calm man, exclaimed with some emotion, Quentin, that power pole is the most beautiful thing to me on the entire ranch. He then made his case. When I look at that pole, I realize that unlike when I grew up here, I will not have to carry water in containers from the spring up to the house to cook, wash my hands, or bathe. I will not have to light candles or oil lamps at night to read. I want to see that power pole right in the middle of the view window. 
My father had a different perspective on the power pole than I did. To him, that pole represented an improved life. But to me, it was a stumbling block to a magnificent vista. My dad valued power, light, and cleanliness above an aesthetic view. I immediately realized that while the pole was a stumbling block for me, it had great practical symbolic meaning to my father. A stumbling block is an impediment to belief or understanding or an obstacle to progress. To stumble spiritually is to fall into sin or waywardness. A stumbling block can be anything that distracts us from achieving righteous goals. We cannot afford to have our testimonies of the Father and the Son become confused and complicated by stumbling blocks. We cannot fall into that trap. Our testimonies of them need to remain pure and simple, like my father's simple defense of the power pole on the ranch where he grew up. What are some of the stumbling blocks that confuse and complicate our pure and simple testimony of the Father and the Son and keep us from being valiant in that testimony? One stumbling block is the philosophies of man. We are committed to knowledge of every kind and believe the glory of God is intelligence. But we also know the preferred strategy of the adversary is to lead people away from God and cause them to stumble by emphasizing the philosophies of men over the Savior and His teachings. The Apostle Paul was a sure witness of Jesus Christ because of a miraculous and life-changing experience with the Savior. Paul's unique background prepared him to relate to people of many cultures. He loved the frank simplicity of the Thessalonians and the tender sympathy of the Philippians. He initially found it more difficult to relate to the intellectual and sophisticated Greeks. In Athens on Mars Hill, he attempted a philosophical approach and was rejected. To the Corinthians, he determined to simply teach the doctrine of Christ crucified. To use the Apostle Paul's own words, and my speech and my preaching was not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Some of the most magnificent scriptural accounts of the Savior and His mission are set forth in 1 Corinthians. One chapter, 15, has received worldwide attention through performances of George Friedrich Handel's Messiah. It contains profound doctrine about the Savior. In the third part of the Messiah, immediately following the Hallelujah Chorus, most of the scriptures used are from 1 Corinthians 15. In a few of these verses, Paul beautifully describes some of what the Savior accomplished. Quote, for now is Christ risen from the dead, the first fruits of them that sleep. Since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? But thanks be to God who give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ." End quote. We know the apostasy occurred in part because the philosophies of men were elevated over Christ's basic essential doctrine. Instead of the simplicity of the Savior's message, many plain and precious truths were changed or lost. In fact, Christianity adopted some Greek philosophical traditions to reconcile their beliefs with their existing culture. The historian Will Durant wrote, Christianity did not destroy paganism it adopted it. The Greek mind dying came to a transmigrated life." End quote. Historically, in our own day, some people reject the gospel of Jesus Christ because in their view, it doesn't have adequate intellectual sophistication. At the dawn of the Restoration, many at least professed to follow the Savior's teachings. Many countries considered themselves Christian nations. But even then, there was prophecy of a more difficult time for our day. Heber C. Kimball was one of the original 12 apostles of this dispensation and first counselor to President Brigham Young. He warned 
The time is coming when it will be difficult to tell the face of a saint from the face of an enemy against the people of God. Then is the time to look out for the great sieve, for there will be a great sifting time and many will fall. He concluded, there is a test coming. In our day, the influence of Christianity in many countries, including the United States, is significantly reduced. Without religious beliefs, there is no feeling of accountability to God. Accordingly, it is hard to establish universal values about how to live. Philosophies which are deeply held often conflict with each other. Unfortunately, this also happens with some members of the Church who lose their bearings and become influenced by the cause of the moment, many of which are clearly not righteous. In line with Heber C. Kimball's prophecy, Elder Neil A. Maxwell said in 1982, much sifting will occur because of lapses in righteous behavior which go unrepented of. A few will give up instead of holding out to the end. A few will be deceived by defectors. Likewise, others will be offended, for sufficient unto each dispensation are the stumbling blocks thereof." End of quote. Another stumbling block is refusing to see sin in its true light. One of the unique and troubling aspects of our day is that many people engage in sinful conduct but refuse to consider it sinful. They have no remorse or willingness to acknowledge their conduct as being morally wrong. Even some who profess a belief in the Father and the Son wrongfully take the position that a loving Father in Heaven should exact no consequences for conduct that is contrary to His commandments. This was apparently the position taken by Corianton, the son of Alma the Younger in the Book of Mormon. He had engaged in grievous, immoral conduct and was being counseled by Alma. We are blessed that the great prophet Alma, who had personally experienced the darkest abyss and the marvelous light, recorded the instruction he gave. In the 39th chapter of Alma, we read how he counseled this son through the repentance process and then explained how Christ came to take away sin. He made the necessity of repentance clear to Corianton because no unclean thing can inherit the kingdom of God. Alma 42 contains some of the most magnificent doctrine on the Atonement in all Scripture. Alma helped Corianton understand that it is not an injustice that the sinner should be consigned to a state of misery. But he noted that starting with Adam, a merciful God has provided a space for repentance, because without repentance, the great plan of salvation would have been frustrated. Alma also established that God's plan is a plan of happiness. Alma's teachings are most instructive. For behold, justice exerciseth all her demands, and also mercy claimeth all which is her own, and thus none but the truly penitent are saved. Seen in its true light, the glorious blessings of repentance and adherence to the Savior's teachings are monumentally important. It is not unfair to be clear, as Alma was with Corianton, about the consequences of sinful choices and lack of repentance. It has often been declared, sooner or later, everybody has to sit down to a banquet of consequences. The remarkable and celestial blessing of the Savior's Atonement is that through repentance, sinful conduct is blotted out. After Corianton's repentance, Alma concluded, let these things trouble you no more, and only let your sins trouble you with that trouble which shall bring you down unto repentance. Looking beyond the mark is a stumbling block. The prophet Jacob referred to ancient Jews as a stiff-necked people who despised plainness, killed the prophets, and sought for things that they could not understand. Wherefore, because of their blindness, which blindness came by looking beyond the mark, they must needs fall. While there are many examples of looking beyond the mark, a significant one in our day is extremism. Gospel extremism is when one elevates any gospel principle above other equally important principles and takes a position that is beyond or contrary to the teachings of Church leaders. One example 
is when one advocates for additions, changes, or primary emphasis to one part of the Word of Wisdom. Another is expensive preparation for end-of-days scenarios. In both examples, others are encouraged to accept private interpretations. If we turn a health law or any other principle into a form of religious fanaticism, we are looking beyond the mark. Speaking of important doctrine, the Lord has declared, Whosoever declareth more or less than this, the same is not of me. When we elevate any principle in a way that lessens our commitment to other equally important principles, or take a position contrary to or which exceed teachings of Church leaders, we are looking beyond the mark. In addition, some members elevate causes, many of which are good, to a status superior to basic gospel doctrine. They substitute their devotion to the cause as their first commitment and relegate their commitment to the Savior and His teachings to a secondary position. If we elevate anything above our devotion to the Savior, if our conduct rec recognizes Him as just another teacher and not the divine Son of God, then we are looking beyond the mark. Jesus Christ is the mark. The 76th section of the Doctrine and Covenants makes it clear being valiant in the testimony of Jesus is the simple, essential test between those who will inherit the blessings of the celestial kingdom and those in the lesser terrestrial kingdom. To be valiant, we need to focus on the power of Jesus Christ and His atoning sacrifice to overcome death and through repentance to cleanse us from sin and to follow the doctrine of Christ. We also need the light and knowledge of the Savior's life and teachings to guide us on the covenant pathway, including the sacred ordinances of the temple. We must be steadfast in Christ, feast upon His word, and endure to the end. If we are to be valiant in our testimony of Jesus, we must avoid the stumbling blocks that entrap and impede the progress of many otherwise honorable men and women. Let us determine to always be in His service. While seeking knowledge, we need to avoid the philosophies of men that lessen our commitment to the Savior. We must see sin in its true light and accept the Savior's atonement through repentance. We need to avoid looking beyond the mark and focus on Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer, and follow His doctrine. My father saw the pole as a means of providing power, light, and abundant water for cooking and cleansing. It was a stepping stone to improving his life. One writer suggests that stumbling blocks may be made into stepping stones to a noble character and to heaven. For us, being valiant in our testimony of Jesus is a stepping stone towards qualifying for the Savior's grace and the celestial kingdom. Jesus Christ is the only name under heaven by which we may be saved. I bear my sure witness of both His divinity and His supernal role in the Father's plan. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. In my mind, I imagine you of the rising generation watching or listening to this conference session somewhere in the world, I'd like to share a true story with you, a story that can be both an example and a lesson. It can show you how to get closer to the Lord and access greater power to resist temptation. This is a story of a young girl living in New York who, before the age of three, lost her father when his boat sank on a large lake. She. Her mother, older brother, and younger sister moved to a new city in another state to live with her aunt and uncle. Sometime after the family arrived, missionaries and members of a newly organized religion came to their town with the glorious news of the restoration of the gospel. They told a remarkable story of an angel delivering an ancient record to a young man named Joseph Smith a record he had translated by the power of God. Two of the visitors, Oliver Cowdery and John Whitmer, had actually seen the engraved metal pages of the ancient record 
with their own eyes. And Whitmer witnessed that he had held the gold plates in his own hands. The record had been recently published, and Brother Whitmer brought the book with him. The name of the book, of course, was the Book of Mormon. When 12-year-old Mary heard the missionary speak about the book, she had a special feeling in her heart. Even though the Book of Mormon was thick with many pages, Mary yearned to read it. When Brother Whitmer departed, he gave one precious copy of the book to Brother Isaac Morley, who was a friend of Mary's uncle and a local leader in the new church. Mary later recorded, I went to Brother Morley's house and asked to see the book. He put it in my hand and asked, and as I looked at it, I felt such a desire to read it that I could not refrain from asking him to let me take it home and read it. He said he had hardly time to read a chapter in it himself, and but few of the brethren had even seen it. But I pled so earnestly for it, he finally said, Child, if you will bring this book home before breakfast tomorrow morning, you may take it. Mary ran home and was so captured by the book that she, stop, she stayed up nearly all night reading it. The next morning, when she returned the book, Brother Morley said, I guess you did not read much in it, and I don't believe you can tell me one word of it. Mary stood up straight and repeated from memory the first verse of the Book of Mormon. She then told him the story of the prophet Nephi. Mary later wrote, He gazed at me in surprise and said, Child, take this book home and finish it. I can wait. A short time later, Mary finished reading the book and was the first person in her town to read the entire book. She knew it was true and that it came from Heavenly Father. As she looked to the book, she looked to the Lord. One month later, a special visitor came to her house. Here is what Mary wrote about her memorable encounter that day. When Joseph Smith saw me, he looked at me so earnestly. After a moment or two, he gave me a great blessing and made me a present of the book and said he would give Brother Morley another copy. We all felt that he was a man of God, for he spoke with power and as one having authority. This young girl, Mary Elizabeth Rollins, saw many other miracles in her life and always kept her testimony of the Book of Mormon. This story has special meaning to me because she is my fourth great aunt. Through Mary's example, along with other experiences in my life, I have learned that one is never too young to seek and receive a personal testimony of the Book of Mormon. There is a personal lesson for you in Mary's story. Each of you young men, young women, and children can have the same feeling she did. When you read the Book of Mormon and pray with a desire to know it is true, you too can receive the same impression in your heart that Mary received. You may also find that as you stand and bear witness of the Book of Mormon, you'll feel the same spirit of confirmation. The Holy Ghost will speak to your heart. You can also feel the same spirit of confirmation when you hear others share their testimony of the Book of Mormon. Each of these spiritual witnesses can lead to the Book of Mormon becoming the keystone of your testimony. Let me explain. The prophet Joseph Smith, who translated the Book of Mormon through the gift and power of God, described the Book of Mormon as the most correct of any book on earth and the keystone of our religion. Since the Book of Mormon's first printing in 1830, more than 174 million copies have been published in 110 different languages, demonstrating that the Book of Mormon is still the keystone of our religion. But what does this mean to each of you? Well, in architectural terms, a keystone is a main element in an arched gateway. It is the wedge-shaped stone at the very center and at the highest point of an arch. It is the most important of the stones because it keeps the sides of the arch in place, preventing collapse. 
and it is the structural element that assures that the gate or opening below is passable. In gospel terms, it is a gift and blessing from the Lord that the keystone of our religion is something as tangible and graspable as the Book of Mormon and that you can hold it and read it. Can you see the Book of Mormon as your keystone, your spiritual center of strength? President Ezra Taft Benson expanded on these teachings of Joseph Smith. He said, quote, There are three ways in which the Book of Mormon is the keystone of our religion. It is the keystone of our witness of Christ. It is the keystone of our, of our doctrine. It is the keystone of testimony. President Benson further taught, The Book of Mormon teaches us truth and bears testimony of Christ. But there is something more. There is a power in the book which will begin to flow into your lives the moment you begin a serious study of the book. You will find greater power to resist temptation. You will find the power to stay on the straight and narrow path." Close quote. In my case, the Book of Mormon became the keystone of my testimony over a period of years and through a number of experiences. One powerful experience in forming my testimony occurred while I was a young missionary serving in my first area, Kumamoto, Japan. My companion and I were house-to-house -house proselyting. I met a grandmother who kindly invited us into the entry of her home, which is called a genkan in Japanese. She offered us a cold drink on a hot day. I had not been in Japan very long, and I had recently completed reading the Book of Mormon and had been, and had been praying to know with certainty that it was true. Because of my newness to Japan, I didn't speak Japanese very well. In fact, I don't think this woman understood much of what I was saying. I began teaching her about the Book of Mormon, describing how Joseph Smith received from an angel an ancient record engraved on plates and how he translated them by the power of God. As I offered her my testimony that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God and another testament of Jesus Christ, I received the strongest impression, accompanied by a warm feeling of comfort and serenity in my chest, which the scriptures describe as your bosom burning within you. This feeling reaffirmed to me in a powerful way that the Book of Mormon truly is the Word of God. At that time, my feelings were so strong that tears came to my eyes as I talked to this Japanese grandmother. I've never forgotten the special feeling of that day. Each of you can also receive a personal witness of this book. Do you realize the Book of Mormon was written for you and for your day? This book is one of the blessings of living in what we call the dispensation of the fullness of times. Although the Book of Mormon was written by inspired ancient authors, many of whom were prophets, they and the people of their day did not have the benefit of possessing the whole book. You now have easily within your reach the sacred record that prophets, priests, and kings treasured, embraced, and preserved. You have the benefit of holding in your hands the complete Book of Mormon. Interestingly, one of the Book of Mormon prophets, Moroni, saw our day, your day. He even saw you in vision many hundreds of years ago. Moroni wrote, Behold, the Lord hath shown unto me great and marvelous things concerning that day when these things, meaning the Book of Mormon, shall come forth among you. Behold, I speak unto you as if ye were present, and yet ye are not. But behold, Jesus Christ hath shown you unto me, and I know your doing." In order to help the Book of Mormon become the keystone of your testimony, I offer you a challenge. I recently learned that many young people spend an average of seven hours a day looking at TV, computer, and smartphone screens. With this in mind, would you make a small change? Will you replace some of that daily screen time 
particularly that devoted to social media, the internet, gaming, or television, with reading the Book of Mormon. If the studies I referred to are accurate, you could easily find time for daily study of the Book of Mormon, even if for only 10 minutes a day. And you can study it in a way that allows you to enjoy it and understand it, either on your device or in book form. President Russell M. Nelson recently cautioned, we should never make reading the Book of Mormon seem like an onerous duty, like the gulping of nasty medicine to be swallowed quickly and then checked off with finality. For some of you younger children, you might read it with a parent, grandparent, or loved one. If a chapter, verse, or portion becomes difficult enough to discourage your reading, move on to the next and the next. I picture you following the example of Mary. I picture you excitingly finding time and a quiet place to read the Book of Mormon. I see you discovering answers, feeling guidance, and gaining your own testimony of the Book of Mormon and a testimony of Jesus Christ. As you look to the book, you look to the Lord. You will pour through the passages of this precious book and encounter your beloved Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, on nearly every page. It is estimated that some form of His name is used an average of once every 1.7 verses. Even Christ Himself testified of its truthfulness in these the latter days, stating, As your Lord and your God liveth, it is true. I'm grateful for the invitation and promise that the Lord has offered through the, prof through the prophet Moroni to each of you and to everyone who reads the Book of Mormon. I close by reading this invitation and promise and adding my testimony. And when ye shall receive these things, the Book of Mormon, I would exhort you that you would ask God the Eternal Father in the name of Jesus Christ if these things are not true. And if ye ask with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ, he will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. I bear testimony of the restoration of the gospel in these the latter days and of the Book of Mormon as tangible evidence of that restoration. Just as the words of this book inspired a 12-year-old girl to embrace the restored Church of Jesus Christ nearly two centuries ago, the truths you will find there will uplift and inspire you in a similar way. They will strengthen your faith, fill your soul with light, and prepare you for a future you scarcely have the ability to comprehend. Within the book's pages, you will discover the infinite love and incomprehensible grace of God. As you strive to follow the teachings you will find there, your joy will expand, your understanding will increase, and the answers you seek to the many challenges mortality pr presents will be opened to you. As you look to the book, you look to the Lord. The Book of Mormon is the revealed Word of God. Of this I testify with all my heart and soul, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brethren. <clears throat> it is now our privilege uh, to stand on a signal from the con conductor and join as congregation will this one, with this wonderful choir of missionaries in singing Called to Serve. We will then be pleased to hear from Elder D. Todd Christofferson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by Elders W. Mark Bassett and Kazuhiko Yamashita of the Seventy. The choir will then sing I will go where you want me to go. This is the 186th semi-annual general conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.
Thank you for that stirring anthem. The Bible tells us that God is love. He is the perfect embodiment of love, and we rely heavily on the constancy and universal reach of that love. As President Thomas S. Monson has expressed, God's love is there for you whether or not you feel you deserve love. It is simply always there. There are many ways to describe and speak of divine love. One of the terms we hear often today is that God's love is unconditional. While in one sense that is true, the descriptor unconditional appears nowhere in Scripture. Rather, His love is described in Scripture as great and wonderful love, perfect love, redeeming love, and everlasting love. These are better terms because the word unconditional can convey mistaken impressions about divine love, such as God tolerates and excuses anything we do because His love is unconditional, or God makes no demands upon us because His love is unconditional, or all are saved in the heavenly kingdom of God because His love is unconditional. God's love is infinite, and it will endure forever. But what it means for each of us depends on how we respond to His love. Jesus said, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. To continue in or abide in the Savior's love means to receive His grace and be perfected by it. To receive His grace, we must have faith in Jesus Christ and keep His commandments, including repenting of our sins, being baptized for the remission of sins, receiving the Holy Ghost, and continuing in the path of obedience. God will always love us, but He cannot save us in our sins. Remember the words of Amulek to Zezrom, that the Savior would not save His people in their sins but from their sins. The reason being that with sin we are unclean, and no unclean thing can inherit the kingdom of heaven or dwell in God's presence. And Christ hath power given unto him from the Father to redeem his people from their sins because of repentance. Therefore he hath sent his angels to declare the tidings of the conditions of repentance, which bringeth unto the power of the Redeemer, unto the salvation of their souls. From the Book of Mormon, we learn that the intent of Christ's suffering, the ultimate manifestation of His love, was to bring about the bowels of mercy which overpowereth justice and bringeth about means unto men that they may have faith unto repentance. And thus mercy can satisfy the demands of justice and encircles them in the arms of safety, while he that exercises no faith unto repentance is exposed to the whole law of the demands of justice. Therefore, only to him that has faith unto repentance is brought about the great and eternal plan of redemption. Repentance, then, is his gift to us, purchased at a very dear price. Some will argue that God blesses everyone without distinction, citing, for example, Jesus' statement in the Sermon on the Mount. God maketh his sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Indeed, God does rain down upon all His children all the blessings He can, all the blessings that love and law and justice and mercy will permit. And He commands us to be likewise generous. I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, and do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Nevertheless, God's greater blessings are conditioned on obedience. President Russell M. Nelson explained, The resplendent bouquet of God's love, including eternal life, includes blessings for which we must qualify, not entitlements, to be expected unworthily. Sinners cannot bend His will to theirs and require Him to bless them in sin. If they desire to enjoy every bloom in His beautiful bouquet, they must repent. 
Beyond rendering the penitent person guiltless and spotless with the promise of being lifted up at the last day, there is a second vital aspect of abiding in the love of God. Abiding in His love will enable us to realize our full potential to become even as He is. As President Dieter F. Uchtdorf stated, the grace of God does not merely restore us to our previous innocent state. His aim is much higher. He wants His sons and daughters to become like Him. To abide in God's love in this sense means to submit fully to His will. It means to accept His correction when needed. For whom the Lord loveth, He chasteneth. It means to love and serve one another as Jesus has loved and served us. It means to learn to abide the law of a celestial kingdom so we can abide a celestial glory. For Him to be able to make of us what we can become, our Heavenly Father pleads with us to yield to the enticings of the Holy Spirit and put off the natural man and become a saint through the Atonement of Christ the Lord, and become as a child, submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon him, even as a child to submit to his father. Elder Dallin H. Oaks observed, the final judgment is not just an evaluation of a sum total of good and evil acts, what we've done. It's an acknowledgment of the final effect of our acts and thoughts, what we have become. The story of Helen Keller is something of a parable suggesting how divine love can transform a willing soul. Helen was born in the state of Alabama in the United States in 1880. When just 19 months old, she suffered an undiagnosed illness that left her both deaf and blind. She was extremely intelligent and became frustrated as she tried to understand and make sense of her surroundings. When Helen felt the moving lips of family members and realized that they used their mouths to speak, she flew into a rage because she was unable to join the conversation. By the age of six, Helen's need to communicate and her frustration grew so intense that her outbursts occurred daily, sometimes hourly. Helen's parents hired a teacher for their daughter, a woman named Ann Sullivan. Just as we have in Jesus Christ, one who understands our infirmities, Ann Sullivan had struggled with her own serious hardships and understood Helen's infirmities. At age five, Anne had contracted a disease that caused painful scarring of the cornea and left her mostly blind. When Anne was eight, her mother died, her father abandoned her and her younger brother Jimmy, and they were sent to a poorhouse where conditions were so deplorable that Jimmy died after only three months. Through her own dogged persistence, Anne gained entry to the Perkins School for the Blind and Vision Impaired, where she succeeded brilliantly. A surgical operation gave her improved vision so that she was able to read print. When Helen's father contacted the Perkins School seeking someone to become a teacher for his daughter, Anne Sullivan was selected. It was not a pleasant experience at the beginning. Helen hit, pinched, and kicked her teacher and knocked out one of her teeth. <laughs> Anne finally gained control by moving with Helen into a small cottage on the Keller's property. Through patience and firm consistency, she finally won the child's heart and trust. Similarly, as we come to trust rather than resist our divine teacher, he can work with us to enlighten and lift us to a new reality. To help Helen learn words, Anne would spell the names of familiar objects with her finger on the palm of Helen's hand. Helen enjoyed this finger play, but she didn't understand until the famous moment when Anne spelled W-A-T-E-R while pumping water over Helen's hand. Helen later wrote, Suddenly, somehow, the mystery of language was revealed to me. I knew then that W-A-T-E-R meant the wonderful, cool something that was flowing over my hand. That living word awakened my soul, gave it light, hope, joy, set it free. 
Everything had a name, and each name gave birth to a new thought. As we returned to the house, every object I touched seemed to quiver with life. As Helen Keller grew to adulthood, she became known for her love of language, her skill as a writer, and her eloquence as a public speaker. In a movie depicting the life of Helen Keller, her parents are portrayed as satisfied with Ann Sullivan's work once she has domesticated their wild daughter to the extent that Helen will sit politely at dinner, eat normally, and fold her napkin at the end of the meal. But Anne knew that Helen was capable of much, much more and that she had significant contributions to make. Even so, we may be quite content with what we have done in our lives and that we simply are what we are. While our Savior comprehends a glorious potential that we perceive only through a glass darkly, each of us can experience the ecstasy of divine potential unfolding within us, much like the joy Helen Keller felt when words came to life, giving light to her soul and setting it free. Each of us can love and serve God and be empowered to bless our fellow man. As it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Let's consider the cost of God's precious love. Jesus revealed that to atone for our sins and then redeem us from death, both physical and spiritual, His suffering caused Himself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain and to bleed at every pore and to suffer both body and spirit, and would that I might not drink the bitter cup and shrink. His agony in Gethsemane and on the cross was greater than any mortal could bear. Nevertheless, because of his love for his Father and for us, he endured. And as a consequence, he can offer us both immortality and eternal life. It is poignantly symbolic that blood came from every pore as Jesus suffered in Gethsemane, the place of the olive press. To produce olive oil in the Savior's time, olives were first crushed by rolling a large stone over them. The resulting mash was placed in soft, loosely woven baskets, which were piled one upon another. Their weight expressed the first and finest oil. Then added stress was applied by placing a large beam or log on top of the stacked baskets, producing more oil. Finally, to draw out the very last drops, the beam was weighted with stones on one end to create the maximum crushing pressure. And yes, the oil is blood red as it first flows out. I think of Matthew's account of the Savior as he entered Gethsemane that fateful night, that he began to be sorrowful and very heavy. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Then, as I imagine, the distress grew more severe. He pled a second time for relief. And finally, perhaps at the peak of his suffering, a third time. He endured the agony until justice was satisfied to the very last drop. This he did to redeem you and me. What a precious gift is divine love. Filled with that love, Jesus asks, Will ye not now return unto me and repent of your sins and be converted that I may heal you? Tenderly, he reassures, Behold, mine arm of mercy is extended towards you, and whosoever will come will I receive, and blessed are those who come unto me. Will you not love him who first loved you? Then keep his commandments. Will you not be a friend to him who laid down his life for his friends? Then keep his commandments. Will you not abide in his love and receive all that he graciously offers you? Then keep his commandments. I pray that we will feel and fully abide in his love 
In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. When I was a young boy, my parents received a gift that became fascinating to my younger brother David and me. The gift was a miniature model of golden plates the Prophet Joseph Smith received from the angel Moroni. As I recall, the model plates had 10 or so metal pages with words written on them. However, those pages weren't what caught our attention. We'd been raised hearing the stories of the Restoration we knew of and had sung in primary about golden plates hidden deep in a mountainside and delivered by the angel Moroni to Joseph Smith. As the curiosity of our young minds stirred, there was one thing we really wanted to see. What was written on the small section of the model plates securely sealed with two small metal bands? The plate sat on an end table for several days before our curiosity got the best of us. Although we clearly understood that these were not the actual plates Moroni had delivered, we wanted to view the sealed portion so, on several occasions, my brother and I tried using butter knives, old spoons, and anything else we could imagine to pry apart the sealed portion of the plates, just enough to see what they contained, but not too much to break the small bands. We were at least smart enough not to leave a trace of our mischievous boyhood curiosity. To our disappointment and frustration, these attempts to pry at the plates were always unsuccessful. I still don't know what, if anything, was hidden under that sealed portion. But the embarrassing part of our story is that, to this day, I have no idea what was written on the portion of the metal pages that was meant to be read. I can only imagine that these pages contain stories of the Restoration, testimonies of Joseph Smith, the three and eight witnesses who actually saw the plates Moroni delivered. Since the creation of this earth, our loving Father in heaven has provided direction, leadership, and instruction to his children through prophets. His words have been passed down through these prophets and are saved as scripture for our development and learning. Nephi described it this way, for my soul delighteth in the scriptures and my heart pondereth them and writeth them for the learning and the profit of my children. Behold, my soul delighteth in the things of the Lord, and my heart pondereth continually upon the things which I have seen and heard. In addition, during past dispensations and in this last dispensation of the fullness of times, worthy members of the Lord's Church have been blessed with the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost, who aids in our spiritual development and learning. Knowing the diligent nature of my younger brother, I imagine it very likely that he read all the words written on the model plates in our parents' home. I, however, ignored those plain and precious truths and instead exerted my efforts searching for those things that were not meant to be revealed. Sadly, our development and learning can at times be slowed or, or even halted by an ill-conceived desire to pry at the plates. These actions can lead us to seek after things that are not necessarily meant to be understood at this time, all the while ignoring the beautiful truths that are meant for us and our circumstances, the truths that Nephi described as written for our learning and profit. Nephi's brother Jacob taught, Behold, great and marvelous are the works of the Lord. How unsearchable are the depths of the mysteries of him and it is impossible that man should find out all his ways. Jacob's words teach us that we cannot successfully pry at the plates or force the mysteries of God to be revealed unto us. Instead, the mysteries of God are unfolded unto us only according to his will and by the power of the Holy Ghost. Jacob continues, And no man knoweth of his ways, save it be revealed unto him. Wherefore, brethren, despise not the revelations of God. For behold, by the power of his word, man came upon the face of the earth. O oh, then, 
why not able to command the earth or the workmanship of his hands upon the face of it according to his will and pleasure? Wherefore, brethren, seek not to counsel the Lord, but to take counsel from his hand. In order to understand the mysteries of God, or those things that can be understood only through revelation, we must follow the example of Nephi, who said, being exceedingly young, nevertheless being large in stature, and also having great desires to know the mysteries of God, wherefore I did cry unto the Lord, and behold, he did visit me, and did soften my heart that I did believe all the words which had been spoken by my father. The Lord himself further explained that Nephi had exercised faith, sought diligently with lowliness of heart, and kept his commandments. Nephi's example of seeking knowledge included a sincere desire, humility, prayer, trust in the prophet, and an exercise of faith, diligence, and obedience. This method of seeking is in great contrast to my prying at the plates or trying to force an understanding of things meant to be revealed according to the Lord's timetable and through the power of the Holy Ghost. In this modern age, we have come to expect that knowledge can and should be obtained immediately. When information is not easily known or accessible, it is often dismissed or mistrusted. Because of the abundance of information, some unwittingly give more credibility to available sources with an unknown origin, rather than relying on the Lord's established pattern for receiving personal revelation. Jacob could have been describing our time when he said, but behold, they were a stiff-necked people, and they despised the words of plainness, and sought for things that they could not understand. Wherefore, because of their blindness, which blindness came by looking beyond the mark, they must needs fall. For God hath taken away his plainness from them, and delivered unto them many things which they cannot understand, because they desired it. In contrast is President Dieter F. Uchtdorf's counsel. He spoke of missionaries, but his words are equally applicable to all seekers of spiritual truth. When missionaries have faith in Jesus Christ, he said, they will trust the Lord enough to follow his commandments, even when they do not completely understand the reasons for them. Their faith will be manifest through diligence and through work. During last April's General Conference, Elder Dallin H. Oaks explained, the Church is making great efforts to be transparent with the records we have. But after all we can publish, our members are sometimes left with basic questions that cannot be resolved by study. Some things can be learned only by faith. Ancient prophets taught this same principle, demonstrating that over time human nature has not changed and that the Lord's pattern for learning is timeless. Consider this Old Testament proverb, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Isaiah explained, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Nephi added another witness when he proclaimed, O Lord, I have trusted in thee, and I will trust in thee forever. Faith and trust in the Lord require us to acknowledge that His wisdom is superior to our own. We must also acknowledge that His plan provides the greatest potential for spiritual development and learning. We were never expected to have a perfect understanding of things during this mortal existence. Instead, we are expected to hope for things which are not seen, which are true. Even with Nephi's great faith, He acknowledged his limited understanding when he responded to the angel who asked him, Knowest thou the condescension of God? Nephi replied, I know that he loveth his children. Nevertheless, I do not know the meaning of all things. Similarly, Alma expressed to his son Helaman 
Now these mysteries are not yet fully made known unto me. Wherefore, I shall forbear. I express my witness that our Father in heaven loves his children, and yet, like Nephi and Alma, I do not know the meaning of all things, nor do I need to know all things. I too shall forbear and wait patiently upon the Lord, knowing I have all things as a testimony that these things are true. And ye also have, a te- have all things as a testimony unto you that they are true. The scriptures are laid before thee, yea, and all things denote there is a God. Yea, even the earth and all things that are upon the face of it, yea, and its motion, yea, and also all the planets which move in their regular form do witness that there is a supreme creator. As we acknowledge that we are the workmanship of a wise and devoted Father in heaven, oh then, why not allow him to guide our spiritual development and learning according to his will and pleasure rather than our own? He lives. Jesus Christ is his only begotten Son and the Redeemer of mankind. Because of Christ's infinite atonement, he has the wisdom and foresight to guide us in these latter days. Joseph Smith is his prophet, chosen to restore his kingdom on earth to its fullness. Thomas S. Monson is his living prophet and spokesman today. Of this, I bear my sincere witness. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, today I would like to speak to the young people of the church, including our wonderful missionaries. Of course, brothers and sisters who are young at heart are warmly invited to listen. (laughs) Last August 21st, President Russell M. Nelson dedicated the beautiful Sapporo Temple, the third temple in Japan. The Sapporo Temple is built in northern Japan in a place called Hokkaido. Like Utah, Hokkaido was settled by industrious, hardworking pioneers. In 1876, a renowned educator named Dr. William Clark was invited to come to Hokkaido to teach. He lived in Japan for just eight months, but his Christian spirit left a lasting impression on his young non-Christian students. Before leaving, he gave his students a parting message that has become immortalized in this bronze statue. He said, Boys, be ambitious. Be ambitious for Christ. His injunction to be ambitious for Christ can help direct daily decisions for today's Latter-day Saints. What does it mean to be ambitious for Christ? Being ambitious for Christ means being motivated, focused, and dedicated to His work. Being ambitious for Christ will seldom mean that we are singled out for public honor. Being ambitious for Christ means that we serve faithfully and diligently in our words and branches without complaint and with joyful heart. Our missionaries serving throughout the world are beautiful examples of those who are truly ambitious for Christ. A few years ago, Sister Yamashita and I served in the Japan Nagoya mission. Our missionaries were so ambitious for Christ. One of those missionaries was a young man named Elder Kawan. Elder Kawan did not have a right leg because of a bicycle accident as a youth. A few weeks after he entered the mission, I received a phone call from his companion. Elder Cohen's prosthetic leg had broken while he was riding his bike. We took him to a good repair facility, and there in a private room, I saw his leg for the first time. I realized how much pain he had been suffering. 
His prosthetic leg was repaired, and he returned to his area. However, as the weeks went by, the prosthesis continued to break again and again. The area medical advisor recommended that as a Cowan return home for a possible mission reassignment. I resisted this advice because Elder Cowan was a great missionary and he had a strong desire to remain in Japan. Gradually, though, Elder Cowan began to approach his physical limit. In spite of this, he did not murmur or complain. Again, I was advised that Elder Cowan be allowed to serve in a place that did not require him to ride a bike. I pondered this situation. I thought about Elder Cowan and his future, and I prayed about the matter. I felt impressed that, yes, Elder Cowan should return home and await reassignment. I phoned him and expressed my love and concern and told him of my decision. He did not say anything in reply. I could only hear him weeping on the other end of the phone. I said, Elder Cowan, you don't have to write to answer me right now. I will call you tomorrow. Please consider my recommendation with sincere prayer. When I called him the next morning, he humbly said he would follow my counsel. During my final interview with him, I asked him this question. Elder Cowan, did you request on your missionary application to be sent to a mission where you would not have to like, ride a bike? He said, yes, President, I did. I responded, Elder Cohen, you were called to the Japan Navia mission where you would have to ride a bike. Did you tell this to your state president? I was surprised by his answer. He said, no, I didn't. I determined that if that is where the Lord called me, I would go to the gym and train my body to be able to ride a bike. At the conclusion of our interview, he asked me this question with tears in his eyes. President Yamashita, why did I come to Japan? Why am I here? I answered him without hesitation. Ella Cohen, I know one reason you came here. You came here for my benefit. I have come to understand what a great young man I have been serving with. I am blessed to know you. I'm happy to report that Ella Cohen returned to his loving home and was reassigned to serve in a mission where he could use a car for his trouble. I'm proud not only of Ella Cohen, but of all the missionaries throughout the world who serve willingly without murmuring or complaining. Thank you, elders and sisters, for your faith, your focus, and your strong ambition for Christ. The Book of Mormon contains many accounts of those who were ambitious for Christ. Our mother younger, as a young man, persecuted the church and its members. He later went through the dramatic change of heart and served as a powerful missionary. He saw the Lord's direction, and he blessed his companions as he served with them. The Lord strengthened him, and he overcame the trials he faced. This Alma gave his son Hilaman the following counsel. Whosoever shall put their trust in God shall be supported in their trials and their troubles and their afflictions. Keep the commandments of God. Counsel with the Lord in all thy doings, and he will direct thee for good. Our second son lived much of his young youth apart from the church. When he turned 20, he had experienced 
that made him want to change his life with love, prayers, and help from his family and members of the church, and ultimately through the compassion and the grace of the Lord, he returned to the church. He was later called to serve in the Washington Seattle Mission. He initially suffered great discouragement. Every night for the first three months, he would go into the bathroom and cry. Like Elder Cowan, he sought to understand why am I here. After he served a year, we received an email that was an answer to our prayers. He wrote, Right now, I can really feel the love of God and of Jesus. I will work hard to become like the prophets of old. Though I am also experiencing a lot of difficulties, I am truly happy. Serving Jesus really is the best, best thing ever. There is nothing as wonderful as this. I am so happy. He felt as Alma did. And oh, what joy and what marvelous light I did behold. In my soul was filled with joy, as exceeding as was my pain. In our lives, we experience trials. But if we are ambitious for Christ, we can focus on Him and feel joy even in the midst of them. Our Redeemer is the ultimate example. He understood his holy mission and was obedient to the will of God the Father. What a choice blessing it is to bring his wonderful example to a remembrance each week as we partake of the sacrament. My dear brothers and sisters, we are ambitious for Christ when we serve faithfully, accept humbly, endure nobly, pray fervently, and partake worthily. May we be ambitious for Christ as we accept our difficulties and trials with patience and faith and find joy in our covenant path. I testify that the Lord knows you. He knows your struggles and concerns. He knows of your desire to serve him with devotion, and yes, even ambition. May he guide and bless you as you do so. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
We are grateful for all who have spoken to us this afternoon and for the beautiful music that has been provided by this choir of missionaries. Aren't all our missionaries, wherever they may be serving around the world, most precious, handsome, beautiful, and just wonderful? We remind the brethren of the General Priesthood meeting, which will commence in the conference center this evening at 6 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. The nationwide Mormon Tabernacle Choir broadcast will be tomorrow morning from 9.30 to 10 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time. The Sunday morning session of conference will immediately follow. Our concluding speaker for this session will be Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. For following his remarks, the choir will close this meeting by singing Hope of Israel. The benediction will then be offered by Elder Alan D. Haney of the Seventy. Nearing the end of his earthly ministry, our Savior Jesus Christ commanded his disciples, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, and go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. All Christians are under these commands to share the gospel with everyone. Many call this the Great Commission. As Elder Neil L. Anderson described in the morning session, Latter-day Saints are surely among those most committed to this great responsibility. We should be because we know that God loves all of His children and that in these last days He has restored vital additional knowledge and power to bless all of them. The Savior taught us to love all as our brothers and sisters, and we honor that teaching by sharing the witness and message of the restored gospel among all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. This is a vital part of what it means to be a Latter-day Saint. We look on this as a joyful privilege. What could be more joyful than sharing the truths of eternity with God's children. Today, we have many resources to share the gospel that were not available in earlier generations. We have TV, the internet, and social media channels. We have many valuable messages to introduce the restored gospel. We have the prominence of the church in many nations we have a greatly increased number of missionaries. But are we using all these resources to maximum effect? I believe most of us would say no. We desire to be more effective in fulfilling our divinely appointed responsibility to proclaim the restored gospel in all the world. There are many good ideas for sharing the gospel that will work in individual stakes or countries. However, because we are a worldwide church, I wish to speak of ideas that will work everywhere, from the newest units to the most established, from cultures now receptive to the gospel of Jesus Christ to cultures and nations that are increasingly hostile to religion. I want to speak of ideas that you can share with persons who are committed believers in Jesus Christ, as well as with persons who have never heard His name, with persons who are satisfied with their current lives, as well as with persons who are desperately seeking to improve themselves. What can I say that will be helpful in your sharing the gospel, whatever your circumstances? We need the help of every member, and every member can help, 
since there are many tasks to perform as we share the restored gospel with every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. We all know that member participation in missionary work is vital to achieving both conversion and retention. President Thomas S. Monson has said, now is the time for members and missionaries to come together and labor in the Lord's vineyard to bring souls unto him. He has prepared the means for us to share the gospel in a multitude of ways, and he will assist us in our labors if we act in faith to fulfill his work." End of quote. Sharing the gospel, the restored gospel, is our lifelong Christian duty and privilege. Elder Quinton L. Cook reminds us, missionary work is not just one of the 88 keys on a piano that is occasionally played. It is a major chord in a compelling melody that needs to be played continuously throughout our lives if we are to remain in harmony with our commitment to Christianity and to the gospel of Jesus Christ." End of quote. There are three things all members can do to help share the gospel, regardless of the circumstances in which they live and work. All of us should do all of these. First, we can all pray for desire to help with this vital part of the work of salvation. All efforts begin with desire. Second, we can keep the commandments ourselves. Faithful, obedient members are the most persuasive witnesses of the truth and value of the restored gospel. Even more important, faithful members will always have His Spirit to be with them, to guide them as they seek to participate in the great work of sharing the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Third, we can pray for inspiration on what we can do in our individual circumstances to share the gospel with others. This is different than praying for the missionaries or praying for what others can do. We should pray for what we can do personally. When we pray, we should remember that prayers for this kind of inspiration will be answered if accompanied by a commitment, something the scriptures call real intent or full purpose of heart. Pray with a commitment to act upon the inspiration you receive, promising the Lord that if He will inspire you to speak to someone about the gospel, you will do it. We need the guidance of the Lord because at any particular time, some are and some are not ready for the additional truths of the restored gospel. We should never set ourselves up as judges of who is ready and who is not. The Lord knows the hearts of all of His children, and if we pray for inspiration, He will help us find persons He knows to be in a preparation to hear the word. As an apostle of the Lord, I urge every member and family in the church to pray for the Lord to help them find persons prepared to receive the message of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. Elder M. Russell Ballard has given this important counsel with which I concur. Trust in the Lord. He is the Good Shepherd. He knows His sheep. If we are not engaged, many who would hear the message of the restored gospel will be passed by. The principles are pretty simple. Pray personally and in your family for missionary opportunities. As we demonstrate our faith, these opportunities will come without any forced or contrived response. They will flow as a natural resource, as a natural result of our love for our brothers and sisters." 
end of quote. I know this is true. I add my promise that with faith in the Lord's help, we will be guided, inspired, and find great joy in this eternally important work of love. We will come to understand that success in sharing the gospel is inviting people with love and genuine intent to help them, no matter what their response. Here are some other things we can do to share the gospel effectively. One, we need to remember that people learn when they are ready to learn, not when we are ready to teach them. What we are interested in, like the important additional doctrinal teachings in the restored church, usually isn't what others are interested in. Others typically want the results of the doctrine, not the doctrine. As they observe or experience the effects of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ in our lives, they feel the Spirit and begin to be interested in the doctrine. They may also be interested when they are seeking more happiness, closeness to God, or a better understanding of the purpose of life. Therefore, we must carefully and prayerfully seek discernment on how to inquire about others' interests to learn more. This will depend on various things, such as another person's current circumstances and our relationship with him or her. This is a good subject to discuss in councils, quorums, and relief societies. Two. As we speak to others, we need to remember that an invitation to learn more about Jesus Christ and his gospel is preferable to an invitation to learn more about our church. We want people to be converted to the gospel. That is the great role of the Book of Mormon. Feelings about our church follow conversion to Jesus Christ. They do not precede it. Many who are suspicious of churches nevertheless have a love for the Savior. Put first things first. Three, when we seek to introduce people to the restored gospel, we should do this in ways that are authentic in loving concern for the individual. This happens when we are trying to help others with problems they have identified, or when we are working with them in community service activities, such as relieving suffering, caring for the poor and needy, or enhancing the quality of life of others. Four, our efforts to share the gospel should not be limited to our circle of friends and associates. During the Olympics, we learned of an LDS taxi driver in Rio de Janeiro who carried copies of the Book of Mormon in seven different languages and gave one to whoever would receive them. He called himself the cab-driving missionary. He said, the streets of Rio de Janeiro are my mission field. Clayton M. Christensen, who has impressive experience as a member missionary, states that, quote, over the past 20 years, we have observed no correlation between the depth of a relationship and the probability that a person will be interested in learning about the gospel, end of quote. Five, Ward Bishoprics can plan a special sacrament meeting to which members are urged to bring interested persons. Ward members will be less hesitant to bring their acquaintances to such a meeting because they will be more assured that the content of the meeting will be well planned to enlist the interest and represent the church well. Six, there are many opportunities to share the gospel. For example, just this summer, I received a happy letter from a new member who learned about the restored gospel when an old classmate phoned her to inquire about an illness she was experiencing. She wrote, quote, 
I was enlightened by the way he presented himself to me. After a few months of learning from the missionaries, I was baptized. My life has improved since then." End quote. We all know many whose lives would be improved by the restored gospel. Are we reaching out to them? Seven, our young members' fascination and expertise with social media gives them unique opportunities to reach out to interest others in the gospel. Describing the Savior's appearance to the Nephites, Mormon writes, He did teach and minister unto the children, and he did loose their tongues that they could utter. Today, I suppose we would say, loose their thumbs that they could utter. <laughs> Go to it, youth. <laughs> Sharing the gospel is not a burden, but a joy. What we call mem member missionary work is not a program, but an attitude of love and outreach to help those around us. It is also an opportunity to witness how we feel about the restored gospel of our Savior. As Elder Ballard has taught, a most significant evidence of our conversion and of how we feel about the gospel in our own lives is our willingness to share it with others." End of quote. I testify of Jesus Christ, who is the light and life of the world. His restored gospel lights our way in mortality. His atonement gives us the assurance of life after death and the strength to persist toward immortality. And His atonement gives us the opportunity to be forgiven of our sins and under God's glorious plan of salvation to qualify for eternal life, the greatest of all the gifts of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.
Our beloved uh, Father in heaven, we're so grateful, Father, for the opportunity we've had to gather and for the things that uh, Thou hast taught us, for the impressions that have come into our minds and into our hearts. We're grateful, Father, for prophets, seers, and revelators, especially grateful for our dear prophet, President Thomas S. Monson. Thou knowest that we pray for him. We feel honored, Father, to be on this earth at a time when the gospel's been restored, when we can preach of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to the world, and that we have a clear understanding of the importance of his atonement. We're grateful, Father, that we can defend the honor of the prophet Joseph Smith and that we can bear witness of the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon. Please help us, Father, to uh, be different after this day and tomorrow. Help us to act. Help us to change. Help us especially to be more kind and concerned about others. Help us to find those who are burdened and struggling and who've lost their way, who have not had an opportunity yet to hear these truths. Help us to reach out, to remember that they are truly our brothers and sisters. Father, we love Thee, and we look forward to the day when we can stand before Thee and be embraced by Thee again. And we say these things in the name of Thy Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This has been a broadcast of the 186th Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. The music for this session was provided by a choir of missionaries from the Missionary Training Center in Provo, Utah. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. <laughs>